We'll just start it. From hostile deserts to lonely islands and the highest mountains, wherever there is space to expand into, humans do so. So it's hardly surprising that we're already making preparations to set foot on Mars and to create the first permanent colony outside of Earth, maybe even terraform another planet and turn it into a second blue home. But wait, before we can get to the nice future stuff, we first have to complete the second phase of colonization, creating a semi-permanent outpost to prepare the ground for a larger human presence. But doing so will be gruesome. I kind of imagined though. I said in another video that I wouldn't want to go live on Mars myself, but that has nothing to do with the project and its perceived importance. And that just has everything to do with personal preference because the logistics, what it actually takes to start a new civilization, it doesn't sound enticing to me. So I wouldn't be volunteering as tribute there. Although who's to say I would even be alive by the time any of this happens and I'm not assuming I would get that invite anyway. But the people who want to go, you know, may they be the ones to go. I would support that fully. If it's you, I'd wish you luck. <laughs> yeah, here's the hypothetical. If you're invited to Mars and you could take your family, would you go? But it's Mars as it is now. Empty. And you would be the first generation or one of the first generations to start up life there. Because it couldn't be me. Even for an expansionist species like us, Mars is extreme. At first glance, Mars seems familiar. Polar ice caps, large valleys, liquid water under its surface, and a day barely longer than Earth's. The ideal place for us to go. Unfortunately, Mars is actually a cold, radioactive desert where the ground is poisonous and breathing is impossible. Mars is awful. You almost certainly don't want to go there. The pioneers doing the hard work on Mars will have an intensely stressful life filled with incredibly challenging problems never encountered before. But there are plenty of people willing to do that work and we have the technology to enable them to do it. And may they for this go video, peace. we will assume there have been prior missions to Mars to scout out a good place for an outpost, store resources and equipment, and that there's already a moon base that serves as a hub for Mars missions. The first major challenge for our outpost is the fact that Mars is very energy poor. Because of its distance from the Sun, solar power is only 40% as effective as on Earth. But even this weakened sunlight is often obscured for days by enormous dust storms. Solar power alone will probably not be enough. Alternatives such as wind power and geothermal energy are also unfeasible as there's hardly any atmosphere and Mars's interior is much too cold. Initially, nuclear technology might be the only option. Since Mars doesn't have easily accessible radioactive elements, the nuclear fuel needs to come from Earth along with the reactor. If we do set it up, it could power our small outpost for the first few years. Unfortunately, all that energy won't be very useful if we can't breathe. Mars's atmosphere is only 1% as dense as Earth's and mostly made up of CO2. So our habitats need to be pressurized and filled with an artificial atmosphere made of nitrogen and oxygen. Have you ever read the book The Martian? They made it into a film with Ben Affleck, not Ben Affleck, the other guy, his friend. Matt Damon. I read that the film had some scientific errors, but the book is really good. It's about this astronaut. He gets left on Mars by accident, and he has to try to survive in that environment. I'll link the book. Which comes with more problems. Corners and flat walls are weak points, so the habitats will have rounded and smooth shapes to handle the stress of great pressure differences between the interior and exterior. The airlocks need to be very airtight and work perfectly every time. Without an extensive magnetosphere or a dense atmosphere, half of all radiation coming from space reaches the ground. A person on the surface would be subjected to 50 times the radiation that they would be on Earth. Three years on the surface of Mars exceeds the radiation dose limits imposed on NASA astronauts for their entire career. This increases cancer risks significantly. To prevent that, we could shield our habitats with a thick layer of frozen CO2 that can be harvested directly from the atmosphere. Covering the dry ice with a meter of dirt would further increase the level of protection. 
Sadly, this means almost no windows. From the inside, most living spaces will be windowless tunnels. From the outside, they'll look like burial mounds. All of this would still not hold back all the radiation, but reduce it just enough to be survivable for long periods of time. It won't, however, protect anyone who ventures outside. So remote-controlled robots will be used for routine work on the surface while our crew stays inside. Staying inside is a good idea for another reason, Mars dust. It's much finer than dust on Earth, so it could find its way into the gears or electronics of our machines. Because it's also very dry, it's electrostatically charged, sticking to everything, like spacesuits. It would be impossible to avoid carrying lots of Mars dust into our habitat and into the lungs of our crew. To make this even worse, Mars' soil is filled with very toxic perchlorate salts. Constant exposure it could be deadly. Bleak. This problem can still be overcome, though. Spacesuits, for example, could be made in a way that they never truly enter the base but stay attached to the outside of the habitats. OK, great. Now we've safely isolated humans in terms of energy and air and protected them from cancer, we just need to feed them. Water is easy to... I'm still thinking about the fact that there wouldn't be many windows and not a lot of sunlight. I mean, we know that natural light and sunlight has a positive correlation with happiness. So I wonder how that would affect the morale of these people after weeks, months, years. I also wonder how that would work with vitamin D deficiency. Would they just be taking supplements and then they probably need all types of supplements now that I just said that out loud though to make up for what they're losing in their environment and the effect on the body. Jeez. Choosing people to go to Mars is sounding a lot like how you would hire for a startup. In the beginning, it's probably just better to hire people who are really excited and I don't know, passionate about the job because the first years are going to be so Come by if a settlement is positioned near the Martian poles with their thick layers of ice. Growing food is a different kind of challenge, though. Mars's soils are alkaline and lack the vital nitrogen compounds that plants need to grow. Before we can grow anything, we will have to decontaminate the soil, which is difficult and expensive. Then the soil can be fertilized using recycled biological waste. All of this will take a lot of time and is very energy intensive. So we might use aquaponics to raise fish and plants together, making the astronauts' diets more varied and tasty at the same time. This will be an important psychological boost for our overworked crew. All of these things don't solve one fundamental problem, though. Mars has only 38% of Earth's surface gravity, which could cause muscle wasting, bone loss, and cardiovascular problems. While this might be solved in the future by setting up rotating living spaces, for now, our crew has to live with low gravity and exercise a lot to slow the degradation down. The crews will probably have to rotate every few years, after being stuck indoors in tight spaces without windows, with the same people, performing the same routines day in, day out, with little contact from the outside world, and a lot to worry about. Like Antarctic scientists or submarine staff, they will undergo intense psychological screening to make sure they're mentally resilient enough to handle this lifestyle for several years. Establishing the first real infrastructure on Mars will be extremely taxing work that only a group of very determined and competent people can do. Luckily, we have enough of these on Earth. And there you have it, a small Mars base that will survive for at least a few decades, as long as it's getting a constant supply of resources, parts, nuclear fuel and crews from Earth. Unfortunately, Mars and Earth are separated by millions of kilometers and orbital periods that leave only a narrow travel window every two years. If there's an emergency in the colony, Earth wouldn't be able to help until the next travel window opens. Helpers may arrive on a planet filled with corpses. Settling Mars will be the toughest challenge we have ever faced. It will be gruesome work to establish the infrastructure we need. But we're stubborn, and we like extreme challenges. If we push through phase two of colonization, anything is possible. Cities illuminating the dark Martian night, a hub for travel between the planets, industries setting foot in orbit, terraforming, a true multi-planetary future. Going to Mars is hard, but worth it. And if we're lucky, we might be around long enough to see it happening 
and cheer on the people who take on these challenges for the benefit of us all. That would definitely be me at the end there, just kind of <laughs> waving them off. I'm thinking now about how important the space station on the moon would be as far as steps to get to Mars, and that doesn't exist yet. When do you think is a realistic year that humans could start colonizing Mars, if you think that it'll happen at all? Because I read articles with scientists speculating that it could be as soon as 2030, but we're in 2024, it seems ambitious and not very feasible. I guess we'll have to circle back in 2030. I've read others that say 2050. I don't know if that's far enough out. Leave your opinion on that. But this was another video from Kurzgesagt. You're going to find the video and the channel linked down below. Thank you for sending it in. And I'm thinking that if I were born in the future, maybe uh, several generations had already been on Mars and all of the kinks were ironed out. I'd be more inclined to want to live there. But after watching this video, I stand by what I said at the beginning that I wouldn't want to be one of the first generations. But yeah, let us know if you're volunteering. And for a book recommendation, I'll add The Martian like I mentioned before. And then there's a short story by Ray Bradbury. He wrote Fahrenheit 451. It's called All Summer in a Day. And it's about life on Venus. The environment is such that it's raining every single day. And some of the children born on the planet have never seen the sun because it comes out once every seven years for a couple of hours at a time. And then the story goes on from there. I'll find you. I know there's a free narration on YouTube because that's how I found the story. And if I can get a PDF version, I will link that as well. And for music, I tried to think during this video, but nothing really came to my mind. If you have a song that's something on subject, let us know the title and the artist down below and I'll check it out. Also, as a side note, I know a lot of you have been following this channel from the beginning, or if not the beginning, very early days. And I do want to thank you for being here and constantly supporting and recommending videos, sometimes on subjects I would never really gravitate towards from channels that I haven't seen before. It's not lost on me that you guys support me and also take the time to watch with me. I'm really grateful for that, so thank you. And actually that made me think of a music recommendation because there's a channel, it's a it's smaller here on YouTube. I think it deserves more attention. It's called The Rumi. This guy, he's a DJ from, I want to say Thailand, but he's mixing jazz and acid jazz, funky and soul. No lyrics. I, I don't think he samples any music with lyrics, or at least that I've heard. I'm going to attach one of my favorite mixes from his channel. And if you listen to any of them, let me know which one you like. It's good music to have on in the background. Now that I thought of uh, David Bowie's Life on Mars. I don't know how I didn't think of that before. It's from his Hunky Dory album, I believe. But if you were watching the last video, we talked about influential video clips or music videos. And I think this song and this video falls under that category. It's from the 70s. I can still picture the makeup on his face and the outfit he had. It's one of his more famous songs as well. So I'll link that. If you can think of another Mars-related song, let me know. And that's really all I have to say. So leave your thoughts on Mars. Thank you for watching with me. Thank you for being here. And I'll catch you in the next. Hey,